what I'm going to do is I'm just going to talk a little bit about some of the weather things that are going on. There are probably specific weather questions you have about me concerning how we do things at the News Channel 5 network or what's happening in the world of weather. So whatever you want, I'll be more than happy to ask, answer, or in, if you just want to know if Vicki Yates is a nice person. Yes, <laughs> she is, is indeed a nice person. But for me, just a quick thing on my day. My day starts at 2 a.m. I am up at 2 a.m. so that I can get to the News Channel 5 dead work between about 3 and 3.30. I am there very early because the news starts very early. We start every day at 4 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> and you think, who's watching? <laughs> certainly, certainly no one's watching. But yeah, you all are watching. Uh, because if you weren't, we wouldn't be doing the news at 4 o'clock in the morning. And so there are a host of people watching. And some days on a big weather day, we may actually have more people watching at 4 a.m. than are watching at 4 p.m. So I go in. We're on the air from 4 to 7 on News Channel 5, or what I joke as the mothership. And then from 7 to 8 on News Channel 5 Plus. So we've got that four-hour news marathon that we do for uh, five days a week. I go in, do weather, and then I am also the co-host of Talk of the Town that runs every day from 11 to 11.30. The job has changed over the years. When I joined News Channel 5 in May of 93, my job was to do weather for News Channel 5. That was it. Do, I was the weekend person. We had just started the weekend morning show. My job was to do weather weekend mornings, weekend nights, fill in for Ron Howes and Joe Case during the week, and that was it. Now my job is to do weather for the News Channel 5 network. So I do it for News Channel 5. I do it for News Channel 5 Plus. I knew it, do it for NewsChannel5.com. We have a radio partnership, and so I am on the radio for 103 WKDF and 104.5 The Zone. If any of you all follow me on social media, I am there as well on NewsChannel5.com Facebook page, on my own personal Facebook page, or my Twitter account, which are just NC5 underscore Leland Statham. And I am there because we have got to be where people are getting the information. Now, the, the interesting thing right now is from Facebook and Twitter, we're not making a red cent at this point. And, and you may not necessarily be on it as much as your children, your grandchildren, the great-grandchildren. Uh, they're on this thing all the time. They're on this more than they may actually be watching uh, television. But if we're not providing information here, even though we may not be making any money, on dot, uh, well, we're making money on dot com, but if we're not making any money on Facebook or Twitter, if we're not there, then we're missing a whole segment of the population. And so our hope is feed them information here, and then maybe we'll get them to tune in to News Channel 5. But let's talk just a little bit about some of the big things that are going on right now. The big thing right now is Harvey. Harvey is just a devastating storm. What you are looking at right now is a forecast for Harvey. Now, where you see what is happening up here with Harvey is that little area kind of in the middle there, that bullseye, that's an area that could end up seeing 20 inches of rain. Now, here's the interesting thing on this. This forecast for 15 to 20 inches of rain was made today. Valid today starting at 7 o'clock this morning through next Monday. So this isn't talking about the rain that's already fallen. So you've got some of those areas down there that have seen 24, 40 inches of rain. And the forecast is some of those areas could get another 15 to 20 inches of rain on top of what they've already seen. The one thing, too, that we'll need to keep an eye out on is New Orleans. New Orleans is under sea level. 
All right, and if many of y'all have gone down there, you know it doesn't take a whole lot for that city to flood. The problem, too, is they've got pumping stations, but I think quite a few of those pumping stations aren't in effect right now. So we're not sure how much they could take, but if this forecast came true, then New Orleans there could end up with maybe 10 to 15 inches of rain. So this is new rainfall. i am uh, got relatives who are in Houston right now. I've got a family of first cousins who live there. They grew up in New Orleans. They've been in Houston for about 12 years. The reason they live in Houston is because they fled to Houston the day before Katrina hit New Orleans. Their deal was to go to Houston and then once everything was done, go back home. Unfortunately, they didn't have anything to, at, at home to go back to. Now, quite a few of the family in Houston is OK, but one of those family members lost everything yesterday morning. And, and so sometimes even as we are reporting information to you, we're also feeling the effects of what's happening with family and family members. Meryl Rose, my co-host on Talk of the Town, has a brother-in-law down in that area, and they got the phone call at 3 o'clock this morning that they needed to evacuate their home. So this situation is going to get worse before it gets better. And the problem here is this is it's all rain. When hurricanes come on shore, we talk about the wind, but the winds are not what will do the most damage. Yeah, it can come on and do damage, but when we talk about what's happening with a hurricane, the storm surge is one of the biggest things that will do damage and the flooding waters. So with Houston, we knew that Houston wasn't really going to deal with the wind issue. We knew what would be catastrophic about this storm would be the amount of rain that they have gotten. For us here in our area, we'll keep an eye on what's going to happen later in the week. You see that area there in dark green saying that Memphis, Paris, Dyersburg could get maybe two to four inches of rain by the end of the week or over the next seven days. And then Nashville, Knoxville, most of Kentucky will get one to two inches of rain. But it depends upon what path this system will take. And so let me get out. All right, so what you're looking at right now is Tropical Storm Harvey and its projected path for the upcoming week. Why is it that the uh, U.S. model and the European model are so different? It is, it, it basically, it's based on the, 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 the dynamics that they use to feed both of those models. But you're right. Uh, the European models and the, uh, the American models, even the Canadian models, are extremely different at times. And part of it is just uh, what uh, they have used to feed those. Now, one of the things that we hope is over the next few years that they will tweak and do more with the American model because sometimes in these long range cases, the European models do a little bit better. They often tend to do a bit better too on some of the tropical storms and tropical systems. But basically it's the theory and the dynamics they use to feed those computers in the very beginning. The uh huh. Yes, and then I hadn't double-checked the, the, the American one this morning, but at one point it was dissipating it over eastern Texas uh, over the weekend. And so this one is, and what the, the Hurricane Center does, they try to blend all of the different models that are out there. And so this is the projected path from the National Hurricane Center through 1 a.m. Saturday morning. If this one holds up, then it puts rain and that the core of that system near Memphis by very early on Saturday morning. These systems can be very, uh, have a mind of their own really. And so this far out, what we're seeing now, we always tell people at this point, don't put, don't go bet the, the, the bank on this, or don't go bet the farm on this one. And that's why you see that area in white there, you know what that area in white is called? It has a name for a reason. 
It is called, the true name of it is called the cone of uncertainty. <laughs> All right. And, and so we try to take the storm path and put it right dead in the middle of that, that setup. But you'll see that cone gets larger and larger by the end of the week. So that's the setup right now from the Hurricane Center, but even their forecast has changed a couple of times over the, the, the weekend with this. So we'll see how this plays out. If it comes that far, we don't get the flooding rain, but we will definitely need to up our rain chances for the second half of the week. If some of the other models are, are true, then maybe our rain chances are less as we go through the end of the week. But as we are also watching this one, so as we're watching this one right now, we are in that time of the year where it's very active. As you get into September, you're getting into the most active time of the year for hurricanes. So there is one off of the coast of Africa that we'll have to keep an eye out on to see if it might become a tropical storm here within the next couple of days. And then... This is one, this is what could become Irma. So while everybody right now is watching Harvey, as we speak, tropical storm warnings have already been issued for parts of North Carolina, where you see the area in blue and where you see the area in yellow, tropical storm watches are already out for North Carolina because what is now tropical depression number 10 later today could become tropical storm Irma. Now you'll note, you see the S's there that say 8 a.m. Tuesday, 8 a.m. Wednesday. We're not worried about this one doing what Harvey has done. So while it's being very slow and drifting off of the coast of Florida right now in Georgia, we do expect this one to pick up steam. It may dump quite a bit of rain at times on North Carolina and South Carolina, but you'll note by Wednesday, it's out to sea by Thursday. It's way out to sea, so it's not going to have the impact that Harvey has. But still, we are in that time of the year where things are very active for us. And so we get into late August, we get into uh, we get into September, and it's that time of the year where we get into the most active time of the year uh, for hurricanes. So something that we will be watching. Uh, not just for Harvey over the next couple of days. We'll be dealing with the after effects of Harvey for the next couple of weeks, but uh, the rest of the hurricane season could be very active for us. Until Harvey hit, there had not been a Category 4 or 5 storm to hit the United States in the last 12 years. The last one was actually Wilma back in 197. No, I'm sorry, back in uh, nine, uh, 2005. Wilma actually hit, and a lot of people don't remember Wilma because it was just a couple of months after Katrina. So Katrina hit, but it was still a very active season because Katrina was late August, early September, and then the storms kept coming. So Wilma was the last major hurricane to hit the United States, uh, and that was again 12 years ago. So sometimes when storms like this happen, people tend to get complacent on things. And so people who are either traveling to the beach or live along the beach, they need to take heed of what's going on. You've already seen what's happened in Houston, and that doesn't include what's going on in Victoria, Galveston and, and Rockport, some of those areas, I think the Rockport area, there are many homes down that way that have been wiped off the map. And so not just the Houston area, but you've got that entire region that's going to be dealing with this thing for, for, for unfortunately, for many years to come. So before I go into the next deal, I'll just kind of stop any other particular questions on uh, hurricanes, the hurricane season, or what you've seen or heard from, uh, from uh, Harvey so far? I'm wondering, is Louisiana affected? Louisiana, yes. Uh, Louisiana is affected. If I go back to... Let's see. So if you look at this particular storm right here, or this particular map, 
you see that area in yellow so that's kind of the where it's going to drift over the next few days but then by thursday it could be on the louisiana border uh, with texas by friday it may be on the northern border with arkansas so their problem is it's going to drift through that area and so it's going to get rain now parts of eastern or western louisiana have gotten quite a bit of rain over the last several days and so as this thing drifts we'll have to keep an eye out on new orleans one particular model has new orleans even picking up maybe a foot of rain between now and the end of the week that would be problematic for an area that's underwater as far as sea level is concerned and for the fact that those pumps down there aren't operating as, as they should okay and one of the things to keep in mind on new orleans the city of new orleans when katrina hit the city of new orleans actually did very well with katrina coming through the problem was it was the rain and the levee breaks so as the rain kept coming you know the following morning a good chunk of new orleans was in good shape and then the levee started to break and as the levees started to break all that water just poured everywhere and so it was a breach in those levees and the amount of rain that the city couldn't handle that was their problem down there and we saw earlier what earlier this month uh, where a lot of rain there was quite a bit of rain in new orleans and part of the city flooded again because the pumping stations weren't doing their job properly you're welcome. Any other questions on tropical storms or what's going on with Harvey right now or the one that could become Irma uh, in the next day or so? Yes. And I have a, uh, a cousin or something in Houston. Mm -hmm. She can't get out of her house now. Yeah. So uh, I'm just wondering when you said some of the houses had been swept away. I'm just wondering. I'm waiting until I go back home so I can call and find out what has happened to her. Well, I, hopefully she, uh, she is okay. Uh, they've got a lot of rescues going on it's been so bad that uh, they've actually and usually rescue people don't tell you this because they don't want the public getting involved but there have been so many rescues that they've asked people if you've got a boat come help us out and so hopefully even if the home has been washed away or underwater hopefully they were able to get out in time that's been the case so far with my family that's down there. Several family members are out on the outskirts of town, so their houses haven't been impacted. But the ones right in Houston, uh, they've lost stuff that was in an apartment. However, they were able to get out. Okay, now, it does, the rain use doesn't usually go to uh, Dallas and that places, those, those places that are inland like that. Mm -hmm. How far inland are they, those places? Uh, well, let's see, Dallas would be kind of more central. Dallas has been getting quite a bit of rain from this. It's just not been to the degree that let's say the Houston area has been getting because as that storm drifted at about one mile per hour, that was all it was doing yesterday, just moving at one mile per hour, the feeder bands with these things, there was one particular feeder band that did what we call a training effect. And basically what that means is rain on top of rain on top of rain in the exact same area. And so there was this feeder band that just kept pulling water off of the Gulf and bringing it right over the Houston area. And so Dallas has seen rain, but they've not seen the rain to that degree. Okay, I've got relatives in Dallas and, and I wonder how, so every time I hear about a lot of rain, mm -hmm. it never floods out Dallas, it seems. You know what, uh, and I don't know the, 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 the true layout of Dallas versus Houston. Most of it's flat anyway, uh, but I know that Houston, I think, is either right at sea level or just under sea level, and so they've got some of those reservoirs down there that can have a tendency to fill up very quickly. And so just because of the layout of the land, I'm not 100% sure on this, but because of the layout of the land, Dallas may be able to handle some of the heavier rain than let's say the Houston area is. But the problem right now is if this same amount of rain had fallen over Dallas, Dallas would be in the exact same shape. Okay. And had that same amount of rain fallen over us, we would have been in the exact same shape. And think of it like this. If you go back to the flood of 2001, Nashville got rain, I said 2011, Nashville, 20, I'm sorry, 2010. Nashville got about six inches of rain 
6.7 inches of rain on day one. Nashville picked up another six to seven inches of rain on day two. So in that two day period, Nashville had 13 inches. So you saw what 13 inches of rain did. And again, it came in spurts, six and a half on one day, another six and a half on another day. Yeah, there were parts of the area that picked up maybe 15 to 20 inches of rain, but Nashville proper had 13 inches of rain over two days. So you've got some of these places that have seen what, two feet, three feet of rain over the same amount of time. And so no matter where that had happened, any other city, big or small, would have been in a similar situation. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. And the other problem, too, with Houston was they, there were some people who evacuated, but Houston was never under a mandatory evacuation. You had the other cities that were closer to the eye of the storm that were under a mandatory evacuation, but Houston wasn't. And so there were some folks who were at home when some of the water started to rise Saturday night and early on Sunday morning. And you've got some folks down there where they're telling people as the water rises at your house, go to the, if you've got a two story house, go to the second story. If from there you need to get into the attic, go into the attic. And they're telling people, if you've got to get into the attic, make sure you take an ax with you because your only way of surviving at that point may be to chop through the roof. And you got to remind folks at this point, if water is up this high, the house is a loss anyway. And so you may need to be able to chop through that roof so that folks can find you. And they're saying, take something with you. Take a rag, a towel or something so that you can wave it so that when choppers go by or when people are going by in the water with boats, they'll be able to see you. But it's just, it's, it's a devastating situation down that way. Fantastic. Yeah. San Antonio is up a little bit more. So far, they have had rain, but most of this heavy rain has been around the Houston area and has been along the coast. What we'll need to keep an eye on as we go through the next couple of days, we saw that, uh, that forecast map a moment ago. So you saw this forecast map right here. Again, that's for the next seven days. So areas north and northeast of Houston will need to be on the lookout. So as you go into the uh, north central, uh, northeastern part of Texas, back into Louisiana, those areas will need to be on the lookout as we go over the next seven days. But so far from San Antonio, I have not personally seen anything of any flooding issues there. They're getting the heavy rain, uh, but right now the heaviest part of it may be in Texas. Now, here's the, the, the deal on that. You may have some other spots that may be flooding, but maybe they're not flooding to the degree of Houston. And so they're not getting the attention that Houston is getting, being that it's the fourth largest city. Yeah. My uh-huh. Okay. Yeah. We'll see when days when it, it doesn't rain and you think it's going to be is because you are watching channel four and channel two and not, <laughs> not getting the right forecast from channel five. <laughs> so now we live in a world with great technology. Okay. Even in this world of all of this fantastic technology, we are still making an educated guess. Now, it's more than me just tossing up a weather coin that says tails, rain, head, snow on the side, sunny or something like that. You know, it's more than that. We're looking at a lot of different things, trying to come up with the best forecast. And, and, and we often hit it. But here's the problem. You know, some days, like even today, the forecast actually is not what we were thinking it was going to be today because we thought there would be a few showers in the area with a couple of thunderstorms, but this stuff has been much more persistent than what we were looking at. We are looking at a host of different computer models, okay? There are actually a half dozen to a dozen different computer models that are out there. Some days, they all agree. They all agree and say sunny. 
You know what I'm going to do on TV? I'm going to tell you Sonny. All right? <laughs> but there are days when you got one that's going rain, one that's partly cloudy, and then one that's saying a mixture of both. And so on those days, I have to kind of maybe go with a gut feeling of which one I think is best. Or sometimes you go, you know what? The last few times that we have had a similar weather situation, computer A has done the best. So I am going to go with computer A because it has a better track record. Or maybe the last four or five days, computer C has done the best over the last four or five days. And so I'm going to use something called persistence, and I'm going to continue with that same computer as the others disagree. And so there are a host of different computers out there. We are taking all of that information and coming up with our best educated guests. But as I like to tell folks, with all of those supercomputers, my nature loves to just throw the weather man and the weather ladies a curveball from time to time, all right, and show who's truly in control. And, and that's part of it. You know, we are trying to give you our best educated guests, but sometimes the models don't pick up on something. Other days, the models do great and people don't remember exactly the way the forecast was, was put out. And let, let's go to snow on that one. All right. Woo, I hate. Huh? Well, well, <laughs> it snows enough to mess up the weatherman and give the weatherman a few more gray hairs. I'll, I'll tell you that, all right? So that's why I hang out with Miss Clara a little bit in my older age, all right? Uh. Uh, well, when you y'all know when you got a couple of kids, <laughs> they'll, they'll age you a bit more. But with the snow forecast, uh, on average, we get eight to ten inches of snow. Now that's on average because an average is in weather thirty years of weather keeping. So that takes the years when it's four or five inches, takes the years when it was one or two inches, it takes the years when it was ten or fifteen inches, and comes up with that thirty-year average. But when we give you a snow forecast, sometimes it's dead on and people go, wait a minute, you messed up. And you know who the worst on that? School kids. <laughs> because I can say it is going to be partly cloudy in the morning, snow in the afternoon. Nashville, you're going to get a light dusting of snow. Down in Lawrenceburg, you're going to get a little bit of snow, but mainly a cold rain. If you're in northern middle Tennessee on the plateau, or if you are up in southern Kentucky, you're going to get four or five inches of snow. And the next morning, that forecast comes out beautifully, just like we said it. Then I get the little kid from Lawrenceburg going, you stupid guy, you told me it was going to snow. I didn't do my homework. <laughs> and, and, and the problem there is, is because after I said snow for the little child down in Lawrenceburg, after I said snow, I became the person on the other side of the phone on Charlie Brown. <laughs> wah, 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 wah. And all that little child in Lawrenceburg heard was, was snow. He didn't hear the fact that I said, you're going to get a cold rain and nothing else. And, and so that's the most problematic. But around here, you know, the snow is the hardest part of the, of the forecast for us. And uh, we have to eat a lot of crow around here sometimes in the wintertime. We, we, we do our best, but the wintertime is actually the hardest time for us. And we've got the challenge, too, of Nashville, the basin, the plateau. So we're forecasting for all of Middle Tennessee, the plateau, and southern Kentucky. And, and, and so there's us trying to get a large area in there. And, and sometimes a snow system that we think might go through Huntsville maybe goes through, let's say, Columbia. Now, that little difference between Columbia and, and Huntsville may not seem like a whole lot, but when you're looking at that rain snow line and you're thinking the rain snow line is going to be here and it's here, that can change the forecast for a whole lot of people. Uh, the, old, the farmers are saying we're going to have a hard winter. That's what the old farmers are saying. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering, with the large hurricane season, if that's indicative of 
the colder weather. You know what? So far, and I should have looked at this before I came in, the uh, forecast for the next couple of months is for temperatures to be at or below normal uh, and rainfall to be at or above normal. I hadn't necessarily looked at that month for December, uh, January, and February, but this far out, even that you have to kind of take with a grain of salt. As far as the farmer's almanac, uh, well, a lot of people put a whole lot of stock in that. It, it, it's great reading material. Uh, we use it for the, uh, for the day and time of, the, of when winter, spring, and fall, and the astronomical start of the different seasons. But we don't necessarily put as, as much stock in it, although I know some people, I remember uh, my, my granddaddy, Big Daddy, had one of those calendars in the back, uh, in the back porch that actually had every, it was a farmer's almanac calendar, and it had the forecast for every day of the year on it. So, but yeah, I think this far out, you can try to put in, averages and come up with a forecast but uh once in a blue moon they hit the, the the season but i think it's really hard to come out that far out many many months in advance and say hey uh look for this type of weather i saw all right let me go here and then i'll come over here yes uh west northwest Mm -hmm. And then also, uh, do most of our heavy snows, which I know we don't get many of, but the, the, don't most of our heavy snows usually come out of the south? Most of our heavy snows actually come from a low pressure area that tracks along Alabama, Georgia, Mississippi. And some of our best snow producers are that area of low pressure that's tracking across the Southland as a cold front coming in, where maybe ahead of the front you got that rain that turns into a cold rain, and then a little bit of ice mixed in with that, and then as the colder air comes in, you get that rain changing into snow. Growing up as a kid in this state, that was some of the, and I followed weather as a kid, so I was a little weather geek as a kid, all right? Uh, but that's how we got some of our best snows. Now, you can still get some pretty decent snows the other way with the front coming in uh, if there is enough moisture in place, but that is the best way. As far as fronts coming in, uh, sometimes people give too much credence to the river or to what's happening on the, on the, the, the Cumberland Plateau. You get more of that if with the higher elevations back out toward the Rockies, but we don't necessarily get that as much here due to the Tennessee River. Yeah, I grew up in Dyersburg, born in Chicago, spent the first five years of my life in Chicago. And then after uh, my mom and dad separated and they both grew up in Tennessee, got married, went to Chicago. After they divorced, my dad stayed in Chicago. Mama came back home. Mm -hmm. I noticed up there on the snow, uh, they don't close down like you do. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Is it because the snow up there is dry? Don't have as much moisture to do that? It's because they get more snow. And it's not necessarily uh, the, the, the moisture content of it, but it's really the fact that most of the time it's snow from beginning to end. Our problem is a lot of our snow starts off with a freezing rain mix or a sleet mix. So you don't have just the snow, you've got that layer of ice underneath that's creating problems there. The other side of that coin too is uh, Chicago, Detroit flat. And so they don't necessarily have to worry about the hills that some of our buses have to worry about. And then they've got better snow plows up there. And so the snow plows are working and they've got snow routes. And you know, if you live in Chicago, you know, if you live in uh, Detroit, that if you live on this street and your car is parked in the roadway on a snow day, your car will be plowed or it will be towed away. We don't have that around here and we don't have the, uh, the number of plows. And so the, because we don't have the, the amount of snow equipment that they have up there, they can try to get some of the better roads, the major roads clear, but we can't necessarily get to all of the side roads like they can in, uh, in New York, Chicago, or Detroit. Okay, Matt. I went to 
work and snow was over my boots. Mm -hmm. And this was at a school. Okay. <laughs> when we moved here, my daughter said, Mother, <laughs> in the threatening snow, they're going to close the schools down. And uh -huh. the were just freezing. <laughs> and when it first closed down the schools, I looked for the snow, and it was not on set. But the streets were slick, you know, it yeah. was rain and uh -huh. frozen. But I couldn't understand that. And then we saw a truck. A pickup truck, and he would, and and, and the guy had a shovel, mm -hmm. like a pickup truck, spewing ice over the streets, and that was that was the only thing that they had for to clear the streets. Mm. And, and again, we just don't have the uh, the snow equipment down south that they do up north. The other thing too on that, let's say for example Rutherford County. Okay. You could be in a part of Rutherford County that saw very little, but because of the way the buses run. Maybe in another part of the county, there is an inch or two of snow that was much more problematic than where you were at. And I, 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 I'm trying to remember the geography down this way, but I'll, I'll give you Nashville for an example. Nashville downtown can be bone dry with snow, no snow at all. But the Davidson County kids, the Antioch kids are going, come on, Jolton, come on, Jolton. Because if Jolton gets snow and the buses can't get up there, it closes the whole system. And it's because, again, buses don't just go to one school. In Nashville, and I think Mur Murfreesboro and Rutherford County are the same, they are doing multi-trips. And so they'll run an elementary trip, they'll run a middle school trip, and then they'll do a, a, a high school trip. And so I will go to Sumner County. In Sumner County, the kids in Hendersonville may not have a flake of snow on the ground. But they're shouting, come on, Portland, come on, Portland, because Portland is on the upper part of the of the ridge of the Highland Rim. And so if it's enough snow up there, that can close snow for for the entire county. And so sometimes even if there's no snow where you at or where you are at, there can be enough snow in other parts of the county to close it down for the whole system. And again, part of that is how they run the school buses, not just in this county, but how they run them in many counties in Tennessee. Could you tell them the difference between the freezing <coughs> rain, sleet, those types of things? Okay. They're confusing sometimes when you hear the weather. All right. Basically, we've just got a cold rain. So a cold rain is it's rain from the, from the cloud all the way down to the ground. Freezing rain is when the rain starts as a cold rain, and then once it hits the surface, your car, the street, once it hits the surface and it's 32 degrees, it freezes on contact. The worst kind of winter precipitation, freezing rain because that's that kind of rain when you go out to your car and you can't open it because it's frozen shut. Yeah, first winter you were here? Yeah. Yeah, try and even chisel it. And, and don't take hot water and throw it over the windshield, all right? You'll be buying a brand new windshield that way. But the same thing is causing the power outages. So when that water freezes on the power lines, freezes on the trees, then the weight of that ice just becomes too heavy. And as it becomes too heavy, then the power lines snap or the tree lim limbs happen to snap. And so freezing rain is the most dangerous of all winter weather. Then the other one would be just sleet. Sleet is, it starts Maybe it started as a cold rain and then halfway down froze in the ice. So it froze to ice before it hit the ground. Then it's an ice pellet hitting the ground. Maybe it started off as snow. So it was snow, it melted, and then maybe a little bit before it hit the ground it froze again and then that sleet. So that's when it bounces off. Now, a little bit of sleet isn't too bad, but when you get a lot of sleet all at once, then that too can be problems for problematic for the roads out there. And then the other one is snow. In order to get snow, it's got to start from the cloud as snow. It can't start in the cloud as a cold rain and then change in the snow on its way down. 
in order for you to get snow, it's got to start off as snow in the cloud and remain snow all the way down to the ground. There are many times in the wintertime it snows at your house or over your house and you aren't aware of it because the snow melted and became rain by the time it got down to you. But there are many times it snows over your house in the wintertime and by the time it gets to you, it is just a cold rain. Grapple is, uh, and I have to go back and just kind of double check myself on this because it's one of those things that happens like once a winter or once every couple of winters, but I think you've got to set up where it's starting off maybe as a cold rain or snow and melting and then refreezing again, but I think as it's refreezing, it's coming in at a little bit of a larger clump than the actual sleet itself. I, I, I need to go double check myself on that because it's one of those things every time it happens, I have to go back and all right, this is how we get it. But it's one of those things that happened like I'm thinking last five years, maybe once or twice in just the last five, four or five winters we've had it. Okay. Uh huh. Each hail that big. Yeah. That much hail. Uh huh. But here you, it doesn't seem to. No. Yes, because of the altitude. The other thing, too, we don't necessarily get the, the lift that we need because, in order for that to happen, you've got to get that rain cell to keep that ice going over and over. Okay? And the reason that that hailstone can get so large is that it starts off as that little piece of hail in the bottom of the cloud, uh, actually kind of a cold rain in the bottom of that cloud, goes to the top, freezes, comes back down, collects a little bit more water, gets a little larger, and then refreezes. And so when you get out, let's say, Colorado, back into Kansas and Nevada and things like that, they can get that, the strong winds long enough to continue the support of that and sometimes the orographic lift can help them out a bit. We just don't necessarily get that here. From time to time, you know, on, on average, golf ball size hail is the biggest for us. We can get a little bit larger from time to time, but it's uh, it's much smaller. Oh, <laughs> uh huh. But yeah, but you're right. They can get it where at the end of one of those systems, it, it looks as if it snowed. Uh huh. Yeah. Yes. Uh, I'm wondering if I might ask a question on different weather companies. Okay. Uh, global warming, I know it's an increasing uh, factor in mm -hmm. global weather. Uh, my interest is, is in the, the vast quantities of methane on the ocean bottom, and, and as the oceans warm, they'll be released. And at what point will the Earth be reaching that tipping point where the, the methane content in the, in the air uh, vastly increases? Uh, now that one, I'd, my, I truly would have to kind of double check myself on that one. Uh, go, I, my personal belief is I'm, I'm a believer in global warming. All right. Now you can, there's still people who debate whether or not it's a man-made factor or if it's a, if it's just a, a cycle of nature. I, I tend to believe that once the reasons that things are going on right now there is some man-made effect that is a part of that. And you have to look at what's happened over the, the span of time to see how much faster that process is going uh, these days. And so I think the reason some of that is happening is be, has been man-driven. And so the other aspect of your question, I personally would have to go back in and just kind of double check, but I am a personal believer in it. I think you cannot look at what's happening in the Arctic. You cannot look at what's happening in Antarctica and see some of those things that are going on and say that global warming is not happening. Or, you, you know, you look at the city of Miami. We're talking about storms right now and tropical storms. The city of Miami right now is in the process of trying to take some of their roads and build them a, what about a half, well, not, maybe not a half a foot, but maybe a couple of feet higher because of the fact of the rising ocean waters down their way. And so you've got coastal communities that have a very 
serious concern on what's going on. They've seen how the water has risen just over the last decade or so, and they know that if they don't do anything, then it's going to be much more tragic for them than if they at least try to get ahead of the ball game. How often do we pull weather updates? We actually pull them several times a day. It really depends upon the model. Some models, there's one model that's almost every hour. Then you've got the other models that update themselves like every three hours, every four hours, and things like that. And so depending upon the models, we are definitely looking at updated information several times a day. I may start my morning newscast at 4 a.m. with one model run, and then by the time I get into the six and seven o'clock hour, new data is coming in. And you know, most of the time, from uh, one to, uh, to one run, there isn't enough to change the forecast. Every now and then you get enough information where you start to try to change or tweak uh, the forecast. But we look at that information all day, every time the model runs come in, come in. And then as we get into the afternoon with a couple of more model runs for that particular day, then start to use that to make the forecast for that night and for the next day. Uh, there are actually several different computers that are out there. You heard mentioned the European model, the American model. Uh, there are several other ones. There's what we call the, the, the HER, which is a high uh, rapid refresh model. There is an RPM model, which is a rapid uh, precision model. And so they're coming in from, most of them are coming in via the government. You know, you've got some private sector in part of that, but most of them are being done by different agencies of the, of the government. Okay. Yes, and then I think I'll go back or right, here and here. Okay, when you're making your forecast, what is here? Mm -hmm. And you're looking over there. What is over there? Uh, when, for, let's do it this way, okay? Let's say that you were watching me do weather at News Channel 5. Mm -hmm. This would be a green screen. This green screen would go all the way down to the floor, all right? Now, my job as a television meteorologist is to fake you out. Now, I want to give you the best forecast because I want you to come back tomorrow and I want you to come back the next week. So I'm going to give you the best possible forecast I can. But part of my job is to fake you out into thinking that there is a big weather map in behind me. In reality, it's just a green screen. Look at your shirt, mm -hmm. all right? Your sh our green screen is about the color of your shirt. And that's, why you can't wear green. that's why I can't wear green, even at Christmas time, even though I love Christmas ties, I have to watch what color clothes I wear because if I wear green, we're telling the computers, anytime you see that color green, don't show it, show a weather map. So that's how the movie tricks are done because I could become the invisible weatherman. I could put green over my head and become the headless weatherman, maybe at Halloween. So what I am doing is as I look at this map or this wall, there is a TV set on this side of the wall. There is a TV set on this side of the wall. When I look into the camera there, if that was my camera, I wouldn't see a teleprompter the news people have a teleprompter. So the reason that they don't have to look down as much is the words are scrolling in front of them. Most weather people ad lib because most of us put together the graphics we give to you. Most of us have put together the forecast that we have given to you or are giving to you. So when I look this way, this way, or this way, I don't need to read the forecast. I need to be able to see me. And so when I look into that camera, I see me. When I look over here, I see me. And so I am actually looking to see where I am standing in front of. The same thing you see at home is what I see in this monitor. The monitor on the camera or the monitor over here. That's how I know where to point, all right? And it, it, it's an old movie trick. It's the same thing they used to make the superheroes fly. I could be super weatherman if I wanted to. Yes, uh-huh, exactly, I, I try, and sometimes depending upon how I am, how tired I am that morning, uh, uh, but usually I try, we try to stand out a couple of feet from the wall so that we're kind of looking back at that monitor. 
Some people have it where they're right at the wall, but we kind of stand out so that we're kind of looking back at the monitor or looking back over this way. Barometer, the easy way to talk about barometer is the air has weight. Okay. And you, you, we can move it around in here and you just can't tell it. But the air has weight. The easy way to tell you is the barometer is a form of measuring the weight of that air. Okay, so when the barometer is high, the air pressure is high on you. So the weight of that air gets heavy as it's pressing down on you. When the barometer is low, that's the rising air. So the weight of that air is lower upon you. So the easy way is barometer is the weather person's way of trying to figure out the weight of the air. And when that barometer is high, there is sinking air. Usually high pressure is our fair weather friend. Because if the air is sinking, the way we get clouds and rain is from the clouds rising. So if the air is sinking, the clouds really can't build. And so on a day with high pressure, it's hard for the clouds to build. What I tell school kids is if you want a big snowstorm to get you out of school, then you want a big L to come by your house because that air has low pressure rising air and that rising air can lead to rain and snow developing. Okay. Okay. What is it that makes my head or anybody's headache in the evening? It's worse. You might not even have a headache in the morning. Mm -hmm. In the evening when, some, when the person does something, you get a headache. You know what? Uh, from a day-to-day -day standpoint, I, necessarily, I can't say as much. I can tell you that from a storm system coming in, there is truth to that. And, and, and so when you tell your children that you've got a headache because you think the rain's coming in, or you tell your children there is an ache in my bones, so I think it's going to rain, <laughs> tell your children the weather guy said you are right, all right? <laughs> there is truth to that. And part of that is, and, it, and then again, I don't necessarily see it as much on a day-to-day -day basis, but if a big weather system is coming in, the pressure is lower, and so is that lower pressure is having an impact on, uh, on people in their, in their head area, their brain area. What's happening when a low pressure area comes in? People with bone breaks, people who are older, are more sensitive to the air pockets. We all have air pockets in our joints, okay? And so as the barometer goes up, and down as that air expands and contract as people get older you're more sensitive to the movement of the air expanding and contracting within your bones and so yes as people get older and they think you know what i feel i feel a little ache in my joints here i think it's gonna rain you can tell your your kids and grandkids the weatherman said there is some truth to that all right a dew point. The dew point is actually the best way for the weather person to know how much moisture is in the air. When you think of moisture in the air, you tend to think of relative humidity. Okay? But here's the deal with the relative humidity. It's relative to the temperature. All right? And so in the morning, the relative humidity can be 85, 90%. That same day, the relative humidity in the afternoon may be 45 or 50%. Because even though the amount of moisture stayed the same, as the temperature went up, the relative humidity went down. Again, the relative humidity is relative to the temperature. So when the temp comes down and they're close then, then that humidity is high. So relative humidity is often 90% of the time, if not higher, at its highest at sunrise and at its lowest in the middle of the day. The dew point is a better measure of the humidity, kind of like the, the humidity put to the Fahrenheit scale. And so that dew point tells me 
that right now the dew point for Nashville when I left this morning was 68. So that means there is, quite, bless you, there's quite a bit of moisture in the year. Okay, now that dew point number is going to stay the same today unless something is out there on the global scale that's going to make it change. But the dew point of 68 this morning is the same thing as a dew point of 68 in the afternoon. The air to you is still going to feel quite muggy. Last week, when the dew point came down to 50, yeah, the dew point may have been 50 or 55, but still the relative humidity at 4 o'clock in the morning was at 85 or 90 percent, even though the air was drier. But the dew point is a better measure for meteorologists to kind of gauge how much moisture is in the air. And when it's in the 50s, like it was late last week, it's nice and comfortable. Between 65 and 70, you feel it. It's a little bit muggy out there. It gets to 70 and 75. It's almost downright unbearable outdoors. And so it becomes very sticky. It becomes very steamy. And it's those high dew point levels too, especially once we get above 70 in severe weather season. That can also be a factor in is there enough moisture for severe weather or tornadoes to develop? Yes. It starts in November, is that right? Yes, late October into November. Our severe weather season, March, April, May. That's when the, the time and the conditions are right for most of our tornadoes to happen. But there is that secondary season where the cooler air of winter is trying to move on in as the warmer air of summer is trying to hang on. And so sometimes that clash in the air masses can give us a secondary severe weather season uh, going into uh, late October into November. The key thing too for us is that don't let those two periods put you kind of in a, in a lull the rest of the year. In Tennessee, we have had tornadoes to touch down in every month of the year. If you remember Christmas before last, there was an outbreak of tornadoes two days before Christmas. For folks who've been around here for a while, Christmas Eve 1989 is when a tornado hits the, uh, the Brentwood area. And then you look at some uh, places in January where you've had tornadoes. I'm trying to remember if Barfield was a January tornado or not. Uh, was it? So you get Barfield, you get Clarksville, you get areas that can get tornadoes in the middle of the night in January. So March, April, May, primary season, October, November, secondary season, but we can get tornadoes and have gotten tornadoes in Tennessee in every month of the year. Alrighty. Well, let me do one other quick thing because I, I was going to talk eclipse for just a second and then we'll wrap up here. How was viewing here? Wow. Well, wow? good. Uh, I felt for the people who were at the Adventure Science Center. They had a little extra cloud cover. There was one gentleman who was, had been biking across the country and he had biked almost a path that the total eclipse was going to take, missed the birth of his grandchild so that he could be on the path of the eclipse and watch it in Nashville, Tennessee. He chose the Adventure Science Center to watch it. And so at the Adventure Science Center, just as totality was happening, clouds came over. Now, just a couple of blocks away or miles away at First Tennessee Park or at the Italian Lights Festival at Bicentennial Capital Mall State Park. They had clouds, but the clouds started to break so that they could see it. I went home, my wife was off that day, so she and I watched it together and it was cloud free. It, it was beautiful. So I do plan to see it again in 2024. As folks used to say, Lord willing, the creek don't rise. <laughs> All right, so this is a map of the eclipse. This was, in a way, a once-in-a-lifetime deal because the last time there was a total eclipse in this area was in the 1400s. 
The next time there will be a total eclipse in this area in 549 years. Now there will be some partial eclipses, eclipses along the way, but the next total eclipse for this area in 549 years. But there is, yes. Dyersburg, they were close. They were close. This time out, Dyersburg was 97%. So they didn't get a total, but they were 90% obscurity. So I sent Mama some glasses so that she and the family could watch. So the first, the, the top line that goes from Oregon to South Carolina, that's the one that just happened. The one from Mexico up to New York, and I told my daughter, that's what you get for getting a job in New York because you didn't get to see this one, all right? <laughs> she only had 65% obscurity on this eclipse. But in 2024, that area there is going to get a total eclipse. Now that's unique because the average time that a, the same place gets a total eclipse is about 350 years. So one place on the map every 350 years gets a total solar eclipse. And again, as you see in the case of Nashville, that could be longer. But go to this area right here, that place that you see in the darker shade, that place gets to see it twice. Now, Hopkinsville was one of the places of greatest eclipse viewing this time out, but Paducah gets to see two solar, total solar eclipses within a seven year period. Carbondale, Illinois, they have nicknamed themselves the Eclipse Crossroads because they get to see it again now. And they were also people who were watching at SIU in Carbondale. It clouded up for them just as it happened. So maybe they'll get a better viewing opportunity next time out. But this area here from Missouri, Western Kentucky, Illinois, uh, they get two total solar eclipses within a seven year period. So I am already trying to make hotel reservations, maybe Paducah, maybe somewhere around Cape Girardeau for the year 2024 because it, it was beautiful. Had any of you all seen one prior to last week? Total. total. Anybody had seen a total? Same here. I had seen a host of partial eclipses. Uh, growing up in Tennessee and working in Tennessee, but it was the first time that I had seen a total solar eclipse, and it, and it was fantastic. And, and so since it's not going to be that far away, I, I plan to go see it again. Any other questions? I thank you all for having me out today. It was great with being with you all today.